Good morning or guten Morgen. My name is Thomas Graf. I'm one of the founders of the Solium project and the co-founder and CTO of the company behind it, which is called ISO Wayland. Today I'm here to talk about Solium and PPF and why we believe it is the future of networking and security. Um, my background is very Linux specific, so I, I've been a kernel developer for about 15 years, not for SUSE. I was working for Red Hat for 10 years. Um, but obviously, we all, we're all friends, right? So let me grab the slide presenter. So I would like to introduce to you why we actually, why we started with Solium. And for that, I would like to give you some background. And before I even started uh, working in, in computers, computers were a thing. And this age uh, that I'm about to present, I didn't even experience myself. But I would like to kind of walk you through how we have been running applications uh, over the last 20 years plus. In the very beginning, there was this dark age uh, where we had single tasking, right? The CPU was not even shared. This I did not experience. I was not, I was not in the computers when, when this happened. But we were already running applications or code. We went into a phase where we were uh, introducing multitasking, and then all of a sudden, the CPU or memory was shared. But the application would still run and directly uh, consume CPU memory and so on. This was the age when Linux distributions started popping up, like SUSE got started, Reddit got started, and so on. We then entered the stage of virtualization. Right? We figured, I don't want to actually deploy my application on a server and like, install it. I would like to virtualize this, run VMs, and run many applications uh, on a particular server, but, but inside of a VM. At this point, we started virtualizing literally everything. We had virtual routers, virtual switches, virtual storage. Everything we had before was done again, but the V was put in front of it. What we're, what we're going for right now is we're com coming back. We're hiding out of VMs again, and we're running applications directly consuming Linux APIs again. So applications are actually like containers. We are consuming Linux system call APIs again, and we're, we're making applications share the operating system. So we're kind of going back to the multitasking edge in, in, in some way. And this change back, this is why we started Solium, because most of the infrastructure tooling we have today was actually written for this virtualization edge, like where, where we would typically serve network packets or storage for virtual machines and not for, for applications specifically. So what does that mean? Like, how does the Linux kernel cope for this new age of microservices and cloud native world? Let's take a look at some of the problems that kind of arise when we run microservices or containers on Linux. First of all, Linux, the Linux kernel basically consists of a ton of abstractions that have been introduced over the years. I'm listing a couple of here. Um, there are many, many more. Right? We have kind of the driver level. On top of, top of that, we have kind of network, network device level, for example, and traffic shaping built on top, then routing, IP tables, filtering. Then we have sockets with the different protocol layers. We cannot actually bypass many of those. We're, we're forced to consume each of them in the right order. And over the years, we have, we have accumulated a lot of code in the Linux kernel. And right now, this definitely increases the chance that you hit, a, a, for example, a performance penalty, some of what we would actually like to get rid of. In the last couple of years, we've seen some of the complexity move to user space for this purpose because not everybody was willing to pay this cost. We, we, we identified and said, this is actually not ideal. Let's find a solution that we can, we can work with the existing abstractions, but, um, but, but bypass them when necessary, for example. We'll go into, into the details. Another thing is that this is kind of the, the Unix, Unix way of doing things. Every single subsystem in, in, in the Linux kernel has its own API. Right? So we don't, we don't have one big tool to control everything. Every, every single subsystem is controlled by a, by a, by a separate tool. Like for, we have for a bit networking specific, but, but we have ETH tool, we have IP, we have ifconvic, we have secconf, we have IP tables, we have TC, we have TCP dump, we have bridge control, we have OVS cattle, and so on. A wide series of tools, and users have to consume every single tool. Uh, and users, that's not necessarily an actual human that could be an automated tool that controls the system. And all of these tools are calling, calling these APIs. It is becoming very difficult to actually um, orchestrate all of them together. A very specific example is if you have five, six uh, tools on your machine, on your node, all consuming IP tables and trying to install IP table rules that then actually um, conflict with each other. 
The last um, kind of example that makes it difficult is that cloud native, um, cloud -native computing requires that the operating system continues evolving because it now again consumes the operating system in a very native way. Um, the Linux kernel development process has some good sides and some bad sides. So like the good sides are definitely it's an open and it's an open and transparent process. This is probably the biggest um, biggest benefit of Linux that it's completely open. Excellent code quality, at least we, we think so. Um, it's very stable because a lot of people are running it and it has been has, has been stabilized over many years. It's available everywhere. Literally runs on every piece of every piece of hardware. It's almost entirely vendor neutral, but then there's some bad things as well. My slide pointer is a bit, a bit slow here. That's why I'm a bit struggling. It's really, really hard to change. So getting a Linux kernel change in literally takes weeks or months. So from intent to implementation to getting a change in takes weeks. And then it takes month or year until that change actually makes it down to the users. So once we have identified a need for a change, it takes us years to actually get that to the end user uh, for consumptions. This is why we see most of the kind of tooling that we built consuming very old APIs, right? Like cloud native computing tooling is currently built on, for example, IP tables, which has been built 25 years ago. It's not been intended for this at all, but it, we're really struggling to do something else because it's so hard to change the kernel and make that change available to users quickly. It has a very large and complicated code base. And this is simply because of backwards compatibility. Right? We were never actually removing code. We're only adding, adding, adding. And then everything we ever added, we have to support for the next how many years. Like we're never actually removing anything ever again. Upstreaming code is hard, uh, not just from a complexity perspective, but also from a consensus finding perspective. Every single change, pretty much everybody has to agree to it. Right? This is making it hard. Time consuming, of course. And then, yeah, I already talked about this. It can, be, it can take years to become um, um, available. So these are some of, of, some of the problems we have been struggling with. Um, and then also the last one, the kernel doesn't actually really know what a container is or what, what kind of the base, the base um, base unit of, of an application is at this point. So let's figure out what the kernel actually knows and what it doesn't know. So what the kernel knows is it knows about processes and it knows about threat groups, right? It doesn't actually know specifically what is an application. It knows about C groups. Right? Container is consuming C groups. It has limits, like it can do accounting, it can, do, it can limit the CPU, uh, it can limit memory, it can limit network, um, this C groups is con typically configured by the container runtime that we see. It knows about namespaces. This is where the confusion or kind of the assumption is coming from that containers are some sort of isolation. But literally all this is is that the kernel will kind of namespace certain data structures and, for example, have multiple network namespaces or multiple user namespaces or multiple mount namespaces and so on. It doesn't actually still don't know what a container is. All it knows is that I have multiple namespaces for data structures. It knows about IP addresses and port numbers. This is, called, this is configured by the container networking, and it knows about system calls made, and it knows about the SC Linux context. This is pretty much what the kernel knows about. It does not actually know that I'm running this particular container. So examples here of things that the kernel has no clue about. Um, the kernel does not know what Kubernetes is. The kernel does not know what a Kubernetes pod is. The kernel does not know what the container ID is. No clue. The kernel does not know what the, um, what the application actually would like to run. So if you're running a Kubernetes pod, which consists of multiple containers, the kernel does not know that these containers are actually supposed to kind of work together. So all of these things kind of makes, makes the kernel struggle to provide a good application framework because it do, it's, there's no concept, no native concept, such as a container in the kernel. It only provides the tooling, and the container runtime on top provides um, kind of the, 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 the instruments for a container runtime to, to use that. So what do we do? Like, 
containers are clearly a thing, and containers are winning. So what, what do we do? We have a couple of options. <laughs> we can give all of, kind of give the hardware away to user space, and user space can kind of rewrite everything from scratch. Like we've seen that a couple of examples would be DPDK, UDMA. Typically, this has been done for performance, not for functionality, or not for functionality needs. Um, another, another alternative would be unikernels, right? We can start right, kind of just rewriting a new kernel subsystem, unikernel, and start have applications consume their own, own pieces of, of operating system and only consume what they actually need. We can move the entire operating system to user space. Like user mode, you know, user mode Linux has been a thing, so it has been tried, and some people are using it. Or we can decide to rewrite the entire Linux kernel, which is probably a hard task and quite uh, expensive. The calculation up on the slide is very old. It's probably way more expensive to actually really do it. But this is an option that we could, that we could uh, follow. Come on. Um, so we're not kind of fading into, this is the background, like, so it's clearly not a perfect fit. So let's look at like, how we could do it better. And in order to understand uh, BPF is what, what we're using, we, we need to understand what the kernel actually does. It's fundamentally an event-driven driven program. Right? We have interrupts coming from the hardware side, and we have system calls coming from application and processes, and the kernel will execute code based on these events. That's fundamentally what the kernel does. There's not much more that it actually does. So it takes about one minute or like 10 seconds to go to the next slide. So what is BPF? So BPF is consuming this base uh, assumption that everything is event-driven, and it makes the Linux kernel programmable. So it introduces what we call a highly efficient in-kernel virtual machine which means that we have some sandbox concept where we can run code in a safe and efficient manner every time certain events are being handled or are, being, are popping up inside of the Linux kernel. And we'll look at a couple of examples on the next slide. So we can run a BPF program every time a system call is being made. Or we can run a BPF program every time a block I.O. device is being accessed. We can call a, and run a BPF program every time a network packet is being received or sent. We can call it for every trace point. So we can call it, for example, when a tree CP retransmission event happens. We can call it for kernel probes, so for arbitrary kernel functions, and even for user space application functions, U probes. So you can run a BPF program when your application code calls a particular function. Wow. So we can, we can extend and program the Linux kernel with arbitrary additional logic when certain events happen. So this is the promise of BPF, and this is why so many people are excited about this. Uh, BPF in the wild seems to struggle to kind of load some of the logos. So the first example on the, on the top left is, is Facebook. So Facebook is a heavy, heavy, heavy user of BPF. All infrastructure, load balancing, DDoS mitigation, load balancing is all done in BPF today. Um, second example, Google. QoS, traffic optimization, network security profiling. We don't know that much about this because they're just consuming BPF in its raw form and uh, to do all of these things, but don't tell the world a lot about it. There's, you can go find information at some conferences where they do talks, uh, but typically they're not broadcasting everything publicly. Then SUSE. SUSE is using like BPF Via, uh, via Solium to do networking, advanced security, low balancing, and traffic optimization. Cloudflare is using BPF to do DDoS mitigation. Cystic Falco is using BPF for container runtime and behavioral uh, uh, security profiling. Red Hat is using BPF for profiling, tracing, and they're working on an IP tables replacement upstream. Then, of course, Cilium, which we'll talk about next, and then even Chrome is using BPF. So when you have Chrome plugins and you run them, um, BPF is used to isolate uh, the, the plugins and make sure that I can only execute certain system calls. So all of you, are, you're already using B, heavily using BPF, but so far it has been well hidden as kind of a kernel level implementation detail. Oh, now they're coming up. <laughs> so how does, how does BPF look like? So what, like, well, it's a virtual machine. What does that mean? So what it really means in practice, I can write a program like this. Simple example, and I can say this program run, uh, runs when the exec system call is, is executed and returns. And this, in this example, I'm collecting some samples, 
and, for example, measuring how many of those system calls am I making. But I could actually make this program more complex and, for example, say, no, you are not allowed to make this, this system call. Or I could modify the system call, the system call, the system call, system call arguments. So I have a lot of flexibility in what I can do. But this is a very simplistic example that shows you what you can do. I will do a very quick introduction of kind of what you can do with BPF. So, in nutshell, you write code in pseudo C code. You compile that, you load that into the Linux kernel. The Linux kernel will verify that the program is safe. It will uh, JIT compile it, we'll talk about it later, and then run it. In order for these programs to kind of communicate to the outside world, which would be user space, you can use BPF maps, which are data structures that can be accessed from both BPF programs and also user space. This is how you can expose, for example, data that you have gathered with a user space process. There's many types of BPF maps, hash tables, arrays, perfing, buffer, and so on. We can, do, uh, we can call BPF helpers. Or BPF helpers allow BPF programs to interact with the, with the Linux kernel. So not everything has to be done natively in BPF bytecode or in BPF code. You can actually call uh, kernel helpers, for example, to change content in a network packet or to redirect the packet to another network device and so on. So all of this is done by BPF helpers. We can do tail calls. So we can, um, we can call other BPF programs. It's similar to function calls. We can use a JIT compiler, which means we write software bytecode, uh, which is arbitrary, it runs on any, any infrastructure, and the JIT compiler in the Linux kernel will then automatically compile that in either into x86, into R and PPC, whatever, so it will run at native, at native execution speed. This is a snapshot of the BPF contributors list to kind of understand who is behind BPF. And there's many, many companies behind this. It is maintained by two main engineers, Daniel Borkman and Alexei Starovoitov. Daniel is working for Silim Frost, Alexei is working for Facebook. But you can see contributions from Red Hat, Netronome, uh, Facebook, Cloudflare from us, and so on. So it's a it's not a Silim specific implementation in any way. This is widely uh, widely supported. Who uses BPF? Well, Facebook is probably the most prominent example, but I think they started at wild scale first. Basically, I think in 2018, uh, one of the traffic engineers came up and, at a talk and, and basically said at the conference, well, every single packet into a Facebook data center since May 2017 has, has gone through a BPF program, and the world was kind of, wow. Like, nobody had any clue that they were using this in production for so long. So let's, uh, let's transition into Cilium. So I talked about BPF, and it sounds exciting, right? But who wants to write low-level C code or like, actually write these programs? So this is why we saw this potential, like, this incredible potential of BPF and figured, how can we apply this to this cloud-native world? To, how we can, can we apply this to Docker, Kubernetes, or like, and so on? And this is why we created Cilium. So Cilium is open source, open source project, Apache licensed. Uh, and it provides networking, security, and load balancing for cloud-native world. I will dive deep dive into, into, into several examples. A very simple one is Kubernetes networking. Uh, it's called CNI. In this kind of simple model, we simply provide networking for Kubernetes. So if you run containers, if you run pods in Kubernetes, Solim will do all of the routing, all of the networking for these pods and ensure that pods can, can talk to each other. We implement Kubernetes services. Kubernetes services are a way to have uh, to make applications scalable and give them a virtual IP or a service IP so you can reach many replicas of the same container um, via one single IP. This is how you can make your services highly available. Um, Cilium with BPF can provides a BPF-based implementation which scales better. The main reason it scales better to the traditional IP tables uh, model is an IP tables model is a linear list of rules. So you literally scan through the list of rules until you find a matching entry and then execute this. Uh, the BPF implementation uses a scalable hash table. Um, that just is faster and better. We can do cluster mesh. So we can, we can connect multiple clusters together. Um, not only on the networking level, but we can also do service load balancing across multiple clusters. So, if, for example, say that this service should, should be highly available, so I will distribute it or deploy it over multiple clusters and have Solium do the load balancing that when all the replicas in one cluster fail, it will automatically fail over. 
you can define service affinity and say um, you should always prefer a local, a local replica first, and if no local replicas are available, move over. So we can connect multiple clusters together. We can do identity-based security. Uh, what does that mean? Very simple. Typically, firewalls used to work on IP addresses. So you would either directly configure the firewall to say, allow from this IP, allow to this IP, or allow this subnet. Uh, what we're doing is a bit more modern. We're actually giving an identity to every service, to every container. And we're encoding the identity in all network, in all communication, in all network packets that are being, being um, um, emitted. You can see this here, this yellow box here. And then when we receive those packets, we can actually authenticate and validate the identity of the sending container. This is more secure and much more scalable. We can do API-aware authorization. Like, what's, what does that mean? Uh, it's again, it's kind of a step from the, to like the, the, the VM age into the container age because typically we would have done something like this. We would have either allowed kind of an L3 firewall rule or you say this service can talk to this service or this container can talk to this container and typically we do this based on IP addresses or container names or pod labels. Um, you would then kind of say, okay, I want to be a bit more fine grade and lock it down to a particular port. Let's say you can only talk on port 80. Um, but this is still a problem in this new cloud native age because everybody's using using gRPC, REST APIs, and so on. So literally, as you open up, let's say, port 80, you open up your entire REST API. So what we can do is we can, for example, lock it down and say, yeah, you can talk on port 80, but you can only do a get to slash foo. And everything else is blocked. So if you do a put to slash bar, we will block it automatically. That's kind of the cloud native or a container aware or an API aware uh, firewall. This is what we believe is necessary for this new edge that is coming up. Give you a simple example. We support many protocols. Uh, HTTP is obviously one, but Cassandra is another one. Uh, so you can go as deep and say, hey, I actually want this container to be able to talk to my Cassandra cluster, but it should only be able to do a select and only on this table. So no inserts, no updates, and it cannot access any other table. So you can really start locking it down. And this is absolutely fundamental in the age of kind of containers and microservices because you will have many services talking to shared resources. Cassandra, Kafka, Redis, Memcached, all of them will be shared, and you need security to actually lock this down properly. Getting, going deeper, right? Um, you have, we'll have services that talk to outside of the cluster. It's not just service-to-service -service communication. You might have a service that is talking, let's say, to SUSE.de. How do you secure this? Like, SUSE.d may, may only be backed by a couple of dozen IPs or something like this. But as you start talking to something like AWS S3 or drive.google.com, these services, they're literally backed by thousands of IP addresses, and there's no way you can, you can whitelist that based on IPs. It's not even, you, there's not even a known subnet that would represent that service. So how do, you, how do you specify security that allows the service to talk to S3 or to drive.google.com, but not to anything else? In this case, we're using DNS-aware policy. So a simple example, there's a front-end service, and it's doing an HTTP request to uh, SUSE.de. Uh, obviously, it would do a, um, a DNS request, so it, re it would, re would resolve SUSE.de, and in this case, in the case of Kubernetes, the DNS server would return back and say, hey, this is the IP address of SUSE.de. Um, with Cilium, we can define a policy that, that says, hey, you can talk, but you can only talk to something that resolves to star.suse.de. And Cilium with BPF will come in and look at the DNS communication uh, and will record the IP that was returned by the DNS server and then only whitelist that particular IP. So it's not kind of polling or trying to look up all the possible IPs of, of the DNS name. It's actually looking what the DNS server responds and then only allowing that communication. So that's another example of cloud native aware or cloud native, cloud -native security that we need. Then we can do fancy stuff. Who knows about service mesh? Couple of hands, great. So service mesh, very briefly, concept that you're running a sidecar proxy in every, in every Kubernetes pod or in every pod, and all the communication between services is going through that sidecar proxy and it's basically getting proxied. This allows to, to implement mutual TLS, retries, tracing, um, load balancing, for example, path-based load balancing, kernel releases, and so on. The downside is that this introduces a lot of overhead because instead of having one connection between services, you have a connection from service to proxy, proxy to proxy, and proxy to service, right? So from one to three. So the memory consumption explodes, the latency explodes, and so on. 
Uh, this sidecar proxy is always running on the same node, on the same machine as the service. Why do TCP, right? So TCP was done to survive a nuclear blast. Why would we want to do TCP there? So what we do, we, 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 we recognize this connection, and we see that both sockets, the socket of the application and the socket of the proxy, are on the same node. And we simply start copying the data between the sockets. And this gives us like a 3x performance increase. You can see it on the slides there. Like it's, like, it's fantastic. All thanks to the power of BPF, which gives us this uh, flexibility. And then kind of looking into, into the future, uh, we can do something like transparent SSL visibility. Maybe some of you have heard about KTLS, kernel TLS. It was done by um, some of the big, big providers of video streaming content when, when they started enabling TLS. They really started to care about how expensive it is to, to, uh, to basically produce that video or deliver that video with, with SSL encryption. And it turns out if we offload the SSL encryption from the application library into the Linux kernel, it gives us a 3 to 4% increase of performance. So this is why KTLS has been done. Right? We can use KTLS to basically, even if the application is using SSL encryption, to gain insights into the data that the application is sending and, for example, do the, do the, the layer 7 or the HTTP aware filtering, even if the application is using SSL. If you want to learn more about this, uh, there's a KubeCon talk from last year that goes into all of the details of this. So, Solim use cases, we kind of went through them. This is a summary. So, Solim provides container networking, right? It's, it's highly efficient. Uh, it's using the same, the same techniques and the same method as Facebook and Google and all the others are using internally. Uh, it, can use, it can run in multiple modes. You can run it in kind of routing mode. You can do overlays. You can do cloud provider native modes. We support IPv4, IPv6. In fact, we have been IPv6 only for the first year. Uh, we tried to go like really native and say everything will be IPv6 at some point. We can do multi-cluster routing. Um, we can do service load balancing, like really scalable. We're not doing any L7, no path-based routing, but we're doing efficient L3, L4. Uh, we implement Kubernetes services, replacing QProxy. Uh, we can do uh, service affinity. We can do, we can do cloud native security. All the examples we provided, identity-based, uh, like layer, layer 7 aware, DNS aware, and so on. We can do encryption. So we can encrypt everything um, transparently. We can basically turn us on, and we will encrypt everything inside of a cluster and, and, and across clusters. And we can do the service mesh acceleration. And all of these are key components to run um, services or containers in a very efficient and secure way on Linux. So all of this we do as part of the Linux kernel, which means it's all completely transparent to the application. Because it's basically, it looks like it's a property of, of the operating system. So with this, uh, this is all the slides I had. I'm sure you guys have several questions. I think we have some time for questions. Yep. Yes, I, I will also repeat the question, so feel free to just shout. The question is, does it support mutual TLS? Uh, Solim itself does not do mutual TLS, but you can run Envoy, Istio, Linkedy, or anything on top. Solim does support uh, encryption and authentication, but we're not using TLS. So we have a method that we can integrate with, for example, Spiffy. Spiffy is in a service identity provider. Um, um, but we will use IPsec in, in, in the Linux kernel to actually enforce it. So you get the transparent authentication, but it's not MTLS specifically. Any more questions? All right, thank you very much. If you want to learn more, here are the links, Slack, GitHub, website, Twitter, and so on. Thank you.